Um, okay, next up is one of my favorite, and I think a lot of other people out there, yeah. <laughs> regular, <laughs> regular expressions. Um, we've got Ilya right here. Uh, let's have a round of applause. And uh, let's hear it. Thank you. So, um, I am indeed Ilya, and I am indeed here to talk about regular expressions in Python. Um, I'll just quickly say a couple of words about myself. I'm uh, just finishing my first year in a master's program at the University of Potsdam. Um, I tinker a lot with the natural language toolkit library in Python, and I made very, very small bug fixes to CPython and Matplotlib. I also work at eGym, which is a German uh, startup that's using digital technology to really change how we interact with fitness. But my talk is uh, not really related to any of the things I do. Uh, in November, there was a post by Amin Ronacha, who you guys, I'm sure, all know as the author of Flask and uh, Jinja2 and a bunch of other useful web libraries. He wrote um, about how he used an undocumented feature of the regular expression module to improve his lecture performance. And reading that, I thought, hey, what other hidden gems are there in the regular expression module that we just don't know about? And so I um, went through it a little bit and compiled a bunch of things that I thought were interesting, and that's what I'm going to present today. Uh, the talk will consist of the following things. I'll just give a very brief, short history of um, the module's development. Uh, then we'll talk a lot about compilation. Then um, I'll go over uh, regular, the, the RE module's flags. And finally, um, we'll talk about the match object interface, like how, what to do once you actually have a match. All right, the history part. Um, the current implementation of the regular expression module in Python is actually the third attempt at tackling this problem. At first, Python came with a module called regex that was sort of more similar to awk and grep in the sense that it was a deterministic engine and uh, it was very basic functionality. Then people um, heard about, about Perl, and they said, we want the same in Python. And uh, the regex module was phased out and replaced by the RE module that had um, PRE as the back end. The origin of the P is a little bit unclear to me. I think it's probably because of Perl. And finally, um, PRE was optimized and basically rewritten from scratch as SRE. It's called SRE because it was written by Frederick Lund uh, from Secret Labs, and I'm guessing that's where the S comes. <coughs> Since then, for about 15 years, it's really just been like the, the only major feature that was added to it was Unicode support, and other than that, it was just basic bug fixes. So it's, it's kind of old um, as far as code goes, and you can see that. Um, it consists of a, of a C module and a, a Python component, and sometimes if you put the two next to each other, it's kind of hard to tell which one's which just from the way they're written. Um, another, another feature that, that sort of got carried over, um, I'll mention later when we talk about, about flags. So enough about history, let's now let it sort of rip on a real problem. Um, and namely, let's tackle something that's been bothering humans for a very long time. Let's search for God. And I think the most appropriate place to start searching for God is actually the Bible. So let's take the King James Version, since it's freely available and it's just a four megabyte text file. Um, really easy just to load into memory as a string and then uh, let RE do its thing. So we just import RE and perform re.search. Wonderful, we get some results, interesting, but we kind of want to expand our search. We want to um, start looking at maybe other texts, what, what other gods we can find in, in some other texts. So, um, let's say we try the New American Bible, or let's try the Wall Street Journal, just for the heck of it. Um, and we can, we can keep adding these um, until we're blue in the face, but you, probably you guys are all itching because I'm, I keep rewriting God all the time, and it would be nice if I didn't have to, if I wanted to change this regular expression, didn't have to go and change it in 50 places. So let's reuse the pattern. The naive way to do this is to just save it to a, a variable and then plug that variable in everywhere where we had God before. Um, another way to do it is to compile it into something mysterious called a, a pattern object and then use the methods on this pattern object 
um, to search. And the question is, why, why would we want to compile? Why would we want to do, use this method instead of just using a string? And the, there's a, several arguments used for this uh, to, 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 to um, uh, encourage it. The official documentation says we can modify the search scope a little bit. So we can, um, a pattern object dot search is different from re dot search in the sense that you can give them this um, start position and end position. So you can search in a part of the string instead of the whole string. That's cool, that's neat. Some other people say it improves readability. This is kind of a, a um, question of taste, so I'm not gonna touch that in this talk at all. I'm instead going to um, zero in on an argument that I've seen on Stack Overflow and that's, uh, that claims it's faster. And I'm not entirely so sure about that. So, is Arita compile faster? The claim is, this sucks, this is better for speed. Let's investigate that using the implementations of all, this, of all these methods. So let's look at re.search re first. I'm getting ahead of myself there. Um, re.search, as we can see, uses something called underscore compile, and then it does search um, on that object. Wonderful. What does re.compile do? Oh, it uses the same function. So just based on this evidence, we could uh, think that, hmm, probably it's better if we compile it first and then use search because we would be saving ourselves a step. But it's not all that simple. If we look at the implementation of underscore compile, we can notice a couple of things. First of all, it uses the cache. Secondly, before it even starts doing anything else, it checks that cache. So what we thought was two compilations essentially, now really boils down to the first compilation in re.search, and then the second time we do re.search, it's just a dictionary lookup. So we're not actually losing that much, um, that much speed. Of course, this is dependent on when the cache gets cleared. It's set at um, 500, and normally, I, I, just based on playing around with it, I wouldn't expect you to run into that limit. But if you do, if you're, you're loading some, some uh, framework or, or module that uses regular expressions heavily, you might and then you sort of get unpredictable performance. Um, but realistically, uh, for, for mo most programs, there's not really gonna be a serious benefit to, um, to using compile in terms of speed. It's going to be slightly faster if, if cache is cleared. And if you really, really care about optimizing that much, I would recommend you really think about the regular expressions themselves because Python and Perl for that matter and most advanced regular expression um, libraries use a non-deterministic um, regular expression engine in the back end, and that is entirely driven by your regular expressions. So if you uh, find a way to, to optimize that, you'll gain lots of, uh, lots of speed. I'm not going to talk about that specifically in this talk because uh, people write books about that. It's kind of a heavy topic. Um, instead, I'm gonna sort of close with, um, close this, this topic by, by um, saying, yeah, sure, use Arita compile, but don't expect it to be super fast right away. All right, let's get back to the Bible. You were reading it and you came across this, um, uh, this line. And you realized, oh crap, my, uh, my regular expression doesn't capture this, what do I do? So you go to the documentation, you read a little bit, and you find that there is a solution. You can use something called re.ignore case, give it to re.compile and then search, and your uh, searches will be case insensitive. But what is re.ignore case? Um, if we print it, it's just an integer. And, um, but we can stack them, so we can combine several flags together using this pipey thing, um, the bitwise or. We can do this uh, again ad infinitum. So what happens underneath the hood? Um, actually, the bitwise or basically takes advantage of the fact that uh, all integers um, encode in binary, obviously, um, and if you choose your integers well, namely if you choose them all to be um, powers of two, they will be basically one hot encodings where the, the one, the only one in the sequence will, uniquely, will, have, will have a unique position. So combining them, chaining them with a pipe, uh, sorry, with, with the bitwise or will just let you know which ones are set. And conversely, if you use um, the bitwise and, you can then figure out uh, which options are present and which are not. Now, this sort of was not on my radar 
for one simple reason. I realized I don't use this pattern in Python almost at all. And then I thought, well, maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I'm just, I'm, I'm a linguist by training. Maybe I just write weird Python code. But I also use other people's libraries and, and they don't use this pattern either. So maybe it's just rare. Maybe it's uncommon for Python these days. So I decided to verify this. What better, better way to verify it than to check the standard library? So I read through the documentation for the whole standard library, a couple of sleepless nights, and um, I found only two modules out of the 240-ish that use these uh, bit array flags. And they're OS for opening and accessing files and socket. So there's two things that are interesting about this. A, almost like the standard library confirms my intuition that they're not very common. And B, the ones, the do modules that do use um, bit array flags are very low level stuff. Um, so to me, it seems like the RE module somehow miraculously retained something basically from an older era that was just sort of refactored out of more or less the, the rest of the standard library, but stayed in, in the, the modules that had to do with low level operations and RE. <laughs> cool. Well, that was a, that was a fun rabbit hole. Um, I'm not in the, in the sort of natural progression in the life cycle of a regular expression um, normally would be to talk about search and matching, but unfortunately um, my C skills are just not up to par to have a coherent picture at this point. They've improved quite a bit when I started, since I started working on this, but I, nothing that I, can, that I can present publicly. So we're gonna go straight to the match object. Um, so, this section, this, this, this part of the talk is a little bit um, unusual, different from, from the previous ones because I'm actually not going to try to say anything new whatsoever. Um, I will just be rehashing things that everyone already knows. The, there are no real um, uh, like underwater reefs or some weird stuff going on when it comes to mash objects, and the documentation is actually very clear about them. And yet, I find, at least personally, whenever I use the uh, RE module, I have to look at it look it up every time. Um, all the difference between group, groups, group dict, and then all the other stuff that you can do with, with match objects kind of throws me off a little bit. And I don't think I'm the only one because I occasionally see code like this when, when, I, when I read others' code. And um, my hope is that I'll come up with like a simple and succinct uh, rule of thumb that will um, encourage people to sort of avoid using that because it's not really, you're not, you're not playing to its strength. So let's, let's have an example. Um, we compile a, a regular expression and this one is, um, I on purpose did it, uh, it chose to be a little bit complicated. It has two groups. The first one, and they're both named, the first one is called leads and we're searching for the string God. Then we have a space and a second group uh, that's named follows, and there we can match any alphanumeric character, uh, at least one or more. Then we have a text. Um, I just chose one sentence, and we get a match. We do uh, the uh, pattern object dot search. And if we print match, we see that. Wonderful. Now what do we do? Well, what can we do to get more information out of it? Basically, the um, what I really want folks to take away from this is that the match object responds to three types of requests, three questions. First of all, um, you can tell it to give you the whole match string. So this includes groups, non-groups, stuff in between, everything. Then you can ask it for an individual submatch. So you can ask it either just for God or for the, the follows group. And finally, you can get all the subgroups together. You ignore the strings, you ignore the parts of the regular expression that are not in groups, you just get the groups individually. All right, so the total match case. You simply call match.group and you get the entire string that matched. Um, you can also call match.group with a zero. Zero is implicit. Um, so the, the, more, the more clear way is to call it without one. Um, and that's literally it. That's all, you, that's, that's all there is to the total match. Then, um, if you want to get individual subgroups, you can start calling dot group with integers, starting with one because zero is taken, 
or you can give it the names. If you named your group, you can give it the names of the groups, and that'll also, uh, oh, I made a typo in there. That second match should be created. Finally, if you want all the subgroups, you just call that groups, <laughs> and that returns a tuple. And if you have named groups, you can also call group dict, and that returns, obviously, an unordered dictionary. So when, when people do call dot group dict and then try to um, access individual keys in there, really the, what they're trying to go for is dot group with the key name. Um, only, you only really need these dot groups and dot group dict if you plan to somehow then pass on these, the, whole, the whole data structure onto whatever you're, um, you're processing. And this the, that's more or less it. The things I want you guys to take away from, from this talk, uh, number one, the RE module is old. Um, the use of flags in RE is kind of unique. You don't really get that um, anywhere else in Python, these days at least. Um, use RE compile, but don't hope that it'll magically speed up your code um, by lots of factors. And finally, I hope, fingers crossed, that you, have, you walk away with a slightly clearer um, notion of what the match object does and how to, how to access it. Thank you. Okay, do we have any questions? Uh, do you know about Python Rex? Uh, Python Rex? Yeah, it's a request like a uh, door expression for humans. Oh, okay. No, I haven't heard of it. I've, I've heard of, um, there's one, uh, there was an attempt to re rewrite the regex module again and expand its functionality quite a bit. And a few years back, they were having lots and lots of wars on the mailing list about adding it back, but they decided in the end basically not to do it. But you can get it on PyPy. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think, I think it uses array anyway in, in the... In the really? Oh, okay. Cool. I got two questions. First is about uh, compile. Uh, you compared uh, compile and search uh, by comparing code. Uh, have you measured it, if, uh, if uh, one of those uh, is faster? Mm, no, I haven't, I have to admit. I sort of went by the, what, which steps would be, um, would be necessary to go and, and do it. Mm -hmm. There's, um, from the code, I couldn't see if there were any sort of optimizations that were not apparent that would then um, show up in timing. Um, but um, we could definitely have a look at that as well. Okay, and the second question is uh, about uh, bit, war, bit RIOs, uh, the second uh, one. Which, which library does it use? Um, socket and OS. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I, I also a question about the flags. What, what's the, I mean, I've used them a few times, and I didn't think there was anything strange. Mm. But uh, what's the alternative, anyway, if you want to like, do a, something I mean, the, the usual thing would be have Boolean flags, right? So you have explicit stuff saying this true, this, or what I've seen also in some places, people use strings. So you say um, this flag, and then you equal, um, equal it to a string, and then you check it later in your code whether it um, is set to that string. OK. Thanks. Any other questions? Already. No? Cool. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.